Good morning, everybody. I'm Pete Plyler, and I welcome you to the third session in our summer lecture series titled Critical Thinking for the Preservation of Democracy. Today's session is on affirmative, affirmative action. As we've had the last two sessions, we are live streaming today's session to five other OSHA programs at the University of Vermont in Burlington, Granite State in Concord, University of Massachusetts at Boston, University of Georgia at Athens, and the University of Kentucky in Lexington. I also want to let you know that CDs and DVDs of all of the sessions are available for purchase, and Donna from CATV is somewhere in the audience and can, you can talk to her during the break or after the, after the session. I'd like to remind everybody again to check your cell phones and please make sure they're off or in silence. And if for any reason you have to leave uh, the auditorium, please exit to the rear. Again, this week we'll have a 30-minute break. And during that break, please bring your questions down, write them, write them down, bring them down, uh, and we'll then take care of those during the, the Q&A. I'd also like to now thank our underwriters and sponsor. First, the Dor Dorothy and Jack Byrne Foundation, Caldwell Law, Ledger, Wells Fargo, and Dartmouth Hitchcock is today's sponsor. I'd now like to introduce our speakers and moderator. Our first speaker this morning will be Neil Kotchel. And if you were watching NBC yesterday, you probably saw Neil uh, commenting on the Mueller hearings at, at Congress. And as a result of that, Neil didn't leave New York until 11.15 last night and got here at 4.15 this morning. So if he falls asleep up here, you'll understand why. Neil is a partner in the Hogan Lavelle's law firm and a professor of law at Georgetown University. He graduated from Dartmouth Phi Beta, Kappa, Phi Beta Kappa and Yale Law School where he studied under Akhil Amar, one of our speakers at the first session this year on free speech. He served as acting solicitor general under uh, President Obama, succeeding Elena Kagan as she succeeded to the Supreme Court. While serving in the Justice Department, he argued several cases before the Supreme Court, including a successful defense of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. In 1999, he drafted the special counsel regulations which guided the recently concluded uh, Mueller investigation. Earlier this year, Neil was in Hanover for the 200th anniversary and reenactment of the Supreme Court Dartmouth College case and he played the role of Daniel Webster. They won the case, by the way. <laughs> in 2015, Neil appeared in an episode on the TV political drama, A House of Cards, portraying himself arguing before the Supreme Court on behalf of a citizen maimed by a drone attack. Our second speaker today is Adam Mortara. Adam is a partner in Bartlett Beck Law Firm and a lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School. Adam earned a bachelor's of science degree in chemistry at the University of Chicago, Phi Beta Kappa, followed by a master's degree in astrophysics as a Marshall Scholar at Cambridge, and a law degree with highest honors from the University of Chicago. Recently, Adam, along with two other partners at Bartlett Beck, were named to the Intellectual Asset Managers Patent 1000, which is a list of the world's leading patent practitioners. Their law firm was also recognized as a leading patent litigation firm. More recently, Adam has been a litigator with a lawsuit against Harvard University, arguing that Harvard has discriminated against Asian American students in its admission policy. The suit was initiated in 2014 by the Students for Fairness in Admissions, or SFFA, and here's how Adam got involved. A lawyer friend of Adams who had represented the SFFA since 2014 reached out to Adam. Harvard had hired a big law firm, while the friend's firm had fewer than 10 lawyers. Since the case was headed to trial, Adam gave his friend the names of several lawyers to contact about joining the plaintiff's legal team. Two weeks later, 
the friend called back and told Adam that he was the person that should join the team. Adam is quoted as saying, quote, my first reaction was, oh boy, I really can't do this. I do not want to go down in history as a lawyer who led the crusade to end affirmative action, unquote. Adam's friend told him that once he joined the legal team and obtained access to the confidential evidence for the lawsuit, Adam would realize that the Harvard lawsuit would be the most important thing he would ever do in his life. After giving some consideration, Adam agreed to join the team, and perhaps he thinks it's one of the most important thing he's doing. Our moderator today is a, a friend, Dan Benjamin. Uh, Dan is the director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth, where he's been here for the past six years. Dan received an AB degree magna cum laude from Harvard and a master's degree as a Marshall Scholar from Oxford. He served five years on the National Security Council staff and as a special assistant to President Bill Clinton. And then he served as an ambassador at large and coordinator for counterterrorism at the US State Department, where he became the principal advisor on counterterrorism to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Please join me in welcoming Neil, Adam, and Dan. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I want to thank Osher for putting together this uh, remarkable sum summer series uh, on critical thinking for the preservation of our democracy. This is a, an absolutely uh, wonderful contribution to our public discourse, and uh, I think at a moment when everyone's asking how come no one has read the Mueller report, this is exactly the kind of engagement we need uh, as we deal with difficult issues at the very heart of our democracy. Uh, I want to thank our two speakers, Adam Mortara and Neil Katyal, for joining us today. I just met Adam last night and really have enjoyed speaking with him. Uh, I'm also uh, grateful to Neil, who I've known for a bit longer, uh, for showing up here on stage because I was absolutely certain that he was imprisoned within my television, uh, where he's been <laughs> providing great commentary on so many uh, of the issues of the day. Uh, today we will discuss affirmative action an issue that I'm sure you're all familiar with and one that has roiled our political life for nearly half a century. The dictionary defines affirmative action as, quote, an active effort to improve the employment or educational opportunities of members of minority groups and, and women. Uh, to give just a little historical background, the origins of affirmative action trace back to the Roosevelt and Truman administration's efforts to reduce discrimination against minorities in government contracting and in the armed services. The phrase uh, shows up in an executive order from President Kennedy that required government employers not to discriminate and quote, take affirmative action to ensure that applicants are employed and that employees are treated during employment without regard to their race, creed, color, or national origin, unquote. Over time, affirmative action has evolved into a set of practices aimed at not only ending discrimination, but of promoting inclusion through, uh, inst through the institution of preferences that gave minorities and women advantages in hiring and education. And for many supporters, this effort aimed at both promoting uh, diverse and integrated institutions and as well redressing historical wrongs. That is, it has been seen as a way of fixing the injustice done by slavery, Jim Crow, and long years in which African Americans and others have been denied basic opportunities. Affirmative action was further shaped by a series of high-profile Supreme Court cases beginning in 1978 with the Bakke decision that affirmed the right of colleges and universities to use race as a factor in admissions. Uh, I hesitate to describe the jurisprudence here before two people whose idea of fun is to argue before the Supreme Court. <laughs> but I hope uh, I am correct in saying that the court, in succeeding cases, approved of affirmative action as a way of promoting diversity in educational settings, but prohibited quotas and so-called racial balancing. Several states, it's worth noting, have passed legislation banning affirmative action in public institutions. Uh, Pete uh, told you about the case that is going on now involving Harvard. 
uh, Adam may be checking his, uh, his iPhone throughout the uh, morning uh, to see if there's a decision, so please have some sympathy for him. Um, this is uh, a truly fascinating issue because affirmative action policies uh, challenge uh, our sense of fairness in virtually every direction. Uh, for many Americans, the notion that some kind of preference for historically disadvantaged groups seems only right as we try to build a more diverse and fair society. And I think for uh, most of us, diversity has emerged as a key value. And yet at the same time, it challenges our belief that every individual should have equal treatment under the law and not be penalized for events in which they played no role and in which in many cases their families weren't even in the country at the time of the, uh, at the, time of the uh, injustice. So what is truly fair and just becomes a very vexing issue. And that is the question our speakers will address today and we'll begin with the affirmative case for affirmative action and Neil Katyal. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is such a delight to be back at my college uh, in my favorite town. Um, and so thank you for all of you for, for showing up today. Um, so what I'm going to do is a limited defense of affirmative action. I'm going to defend affirmative action the way the Supreme Court has defended it ever since the Bakke case in 1978. And what that is, is a defensive affirmative action in the higher education context. I'm not gonna try and defend it in other places like government contracting um, or the like, where I think the arguments are very different. Um, indeed, I think you know, that we can think about three kind of fundamental distinctions, and this is what the Supreme Court has been focused on for the last uh, 40 years. One is that when you're thinking about government contracts, they're susceptible to fraud, and so you could have an affirmative action program, as many states and localities, and indeed even the federal government did, that uh, set aside a certain percentage of contracts for minority owned firms. The problem is sometimes those will be fraudulent. There'll be a figurehead who's owning the firm on paper, but not actually um, in practice. That's obviously harder to do. There is a little bit of fraud, obviously, in college admissions, but it's not um, dramatic. Um, uh, you know, it, to the extent there is fraud, it's not on the race side as much as it's on other sides. Um, a sensitive topic, I know, but, um, uh, but you know, I do think in general that fraud over race is constrained in the, uni in the university application process because you've got guidance counselors, teachers, um, school administrators, and the like, as well as the student actually shows up for four years, and you can you know, often figure out you know, if there, there's some sort of lie on the application or something like that. The second is that, um, a more fundamental difference, is that affirmative action in government contracts or employment, there's no logical stopping point. When does it end? Do you always give preferences to folks throughout their life? Um, I think, by contrast, the vision of affirmative action that the Supreme Court has blessed in the higher education context is this idea that you have a university of education which typically occurs early in life and then ends in higher education by making up for educational inequities at earlier stages in life can be the ramp up to a level playing field. Um, and then the third but most fundamental difference between affirmative action here and in other spaces has to do with the benefits of diversity. And when you have a government contract, you're often balkanizing the races. You're saying that minority firm gets that, you know, installs the guardrails, and that firm, uh, you know, lays down the tar or something like that. There's no emphasis on integration, but that's what university affirmative action is all about. That is its goal. Integrated education doesn't just, it's not just for the minorities. It advantages all students in a distinctive way by bringing rich and poor, black and white, urban and rural together to teach from and learn to teach and learn from each other. And if a far-flung democracy is diverse and indeed at times divided as America is right now, if it's to survive and flourish, it's got to cultivate some common spaces where citizens from every corner of society can come together to think and learn together and how, learn how others feel. If not our universities, then where? And if not in young adulthood, then when? 
So that's Justice Powell's uh, vision in the Bakke case back in 1978. That was a case in which uh, basically uh, Alan Bakke challenged a university program that set aside 16 slots at the David, UC Davis Medical School for minority students. And he was a white student, not admitted. And he said this was unconstitutional. And Justice Powell cast the deciding vote and he said the Bakke pro that, the, that the Davis program was unconstitutional, but that there was a right way to do it. He said that there were benefits of integrated education that benefit all students, and that some affirmative action to increase diversity was therefore appropriate. He said, quote, the goal of a diverse student body clearly is a constitutionally permissible goal for an institution of higher education. It's not too much to say that the nation's future depends upon leaders trained through wide exposure to the ideas and mores of students as diverse as this nation of great peoples. Now, diversity wasn't some magical phrase to Justice Powell, some get out of jail freeze card that you could just say if you were a university and escape uh, you know, scrutiny. He said basically that uh, the, indeed, he struck down the Davis program because he said the fatal flaw of the program was, quote, its disregard of individual rights because it tells applicants who are not Negro, Asian, or Chicano that they are totally excluded from a specific percentage of the seats in their class. And so there's essentially three points that Justice Powell made, and that these are the cornerstones of affirmative action programs in many of our leading universities today, and I think that they're right. So the first point he makes is that diversity can enable an educational affirmative action program to survive constitutional muster because the democratic and dialogic benefits benefit all students. That they, you know, as Justice Powell said, you have to admit sufficient numbers to, to bring to their classmates and to each other the variety of points of views, backgrounds, and experiences of blacks in the United States. Second, he said, a university can't use a strict quota or a set aside because instead the university has to look to the whole person. And indeed, Justice Powell attached an appendix to his decision uh, for, and which uh, outlined the Harvard College program in effect at the time, saying that was the right way to do it. It wasn't just some rigid like percentage that goes to minorities or something like that. And then the third thing Justice Powell said is that there had to be an interest in non-racial diversity, that it wouldn't be credible if a university just trotted out diversity when it came to race, but not to other things, urban and rural, political and liberal, all the other matrices of religious, non-religious orientation, all the other matrices of diversity that are so important, that are part of this story for learning from uh, each other. And that's what he said the Harvard plan was all about. And indeed, these arguments are intermeshed with each other, these three points that Justice Powell made. One reason that a university can't use a rigid quota is because if it does so, it may lead a school to admit unqualified minorities who aren't going to be able to further that educational mission of teaching students. And so, in Justice Powell actually, and I'll, I'll stop the Bakke discussion with this, he actually quoted from the president of Princeton in a footnote and said, quote, a great deal of learning occurs informally. It occurs through interactions among students of both sexes, of different races, religions, and backgrounds who come from cities and rural areas, from various states and counties, who have a wide variety of interests, talents, and perspectives, and who are able directly or indirectly to learn from their differences and to stimulate one another to re-examine even their most deep deeply held assumptions about themselves and the world. And, and I can tell you, there's, I mean, that resonates incredibly powerfully with me, including when I was here as a student. And that was the first time, I was from Chicago, first time I encountered um, some, some minorities, uh, it's the first time I encountered uh, openly gay people. And boy, those lessons did stick with me. And I, you know, I can talk about my experience as an educator too, but I think that there's something pretty dramatic when you come to a place and a place that intentionally curates and brings together people who think differently, act differently, are from different places than you, and yes, indeed, have a different skin color than you. So there's, I think, three interlaced policy points uh, that I want to conclude with um, uh, that I think uh, you know, are, mount the defense of affirmative action. One is, I think it's very important to think about the different in how you do affirmative action. As Justice Powell said, quotas versus pluses. 
It's a real problem when you have an affirmative action program that literally sets aside a certain number of seats for minorities, either in the university setting or any other. Be just because of his skin color, Alan Bakke wasn't able to compete for 16% of the seats at Davis. That strikes me as, as, as fundamentally wrong. Um, you can't have minority applicants segregated into some separate admissions compartment where they only get to compete against each other and not against the entire pool. Um, instead, I think universities have and should be adopting affirmative action programs that treat diversity, racial diversity, the way they treat other forms of diversity. Diversity, you know, Texans or chess players or flute players or, or football players or whatever. Um, background and life experience are positive life attributes and like, you know, growing up Amish or something like that, and it's neither unfair to Caucasians nor stigmatizing minority, to minorities to consider these factors so long as they don't become the only thing that, or the dominant thing that the admissions committee looks at. And if you think about diversity that way, if you think about racial diversity in the same way as you think about being a good violinist um, or a great football player, then I think it's easier to understand the preference. Um, the second thing is the democratic benefits of diversity in education. Um, much of the point of education is really to teach students how others think and how others feel and uh, how to be a responsible, sovereign, uh, and informed citizen in our heterogeneous democracy. And a school is admitting students in large part to be teachers to other students. That's what they're doing. And SAT scores and GPAs are only a rough proxy at best for that. Uh, and if a university wants to teach people, say, about France, it's probably a good idea to admit some students from France. And if they want to teach people about the South, it's a good idea to admit people about the South. And so the university experience is very different from the kind of attenuated relationships um, that exist in the employment setting, because I think it's much harder to justify those types of diversity-based uh, initiatives. Because integrated education benefits people of all races, including white students, by providing a space for people of all races to grow together. And in that sense, I think it can be said that Bakke and this kind of affirmative action been built squarely on the root of Brown versus Board of Education. After all, Brown actually said that education was sui generis, was different, and should be treated differently than other spaces. And indeed, it didn't even technically overrule Plessy versus Ferguson, the notorious 1896 case about separate but equal race cars. The idea was start an education because that's the place that uh, is so important. And inherent in the concept of this kind of affirmative action is a theory of value. It's a theory that says that a minority student actually comes to campus and benefits not just the minority student, but all students. It's harder to make those kinds of arguments in the employment setting. It's not impossible, but it's harder. And in my judgment, affirmative action, and I've seen this, you know, having now taught for 20 years, in education, affirmative action education is a very powerful long-run antidote to the poisonous race discussions that we've been having throughout our history and increasingly so in the last couple of years. Um, there are some pretty good studies on this. I mean, one just done by the military, um, uh, or I should say not a study, but a, but a, a brief filed by uh, our nation's need leading military officials in the affirmative action case, Gruder, said, quote, there is no race neutral alternative that will fulfill the military's and thus the nation's compelling national security need for a cohesive military led by a diverse officer corps of the highest quality to serve and protect the country. And they filed a brief, came in and said, we need affirmative action in order for strength in our military because diversity is part of our strength. Our nation's top corporations have all filed briefs as well, saying similar things in the recent Fisher versus University of Texas case. Um, senior leadership of over 50 Fortune 100 companies said you need uh, an affirmative action system that teaches students how to work in diverse workplaces. As they say, quote, for, for the 50 companies amici to succeed in their businesses, they must be able to hire highly trained employees of all races, religions, cultures, and economic backgrounds. It's critical to the, that all of these university trained employees have the opportunity to share ideas, experiences, viewpoints, and approaches with a diverse student body. 
And there's many studies done, Harvard Graduate School of Education, others showing that uh, a diverse uh, educational environment leads to better outcomes for the students in terms of future employment perspectives and also how they do at the job. And finally, there's stuff, there's I think important studies about unconscious bias and how students who go to more integrated schools tend to ha have reduced implicit bias um, and the like. The final point I'd make is this. Um, uh, much of the debate about affirmative action concerns universities such as Harvard, and you're obviously about to hear from an expert, and I, I, I won't pretend to know uh, what Harvard is doing, um, and uh, you know, being a Dartmouth guy, I don't particularly care. Um, but, uh, um, but, but these are private institutions. And, and I do find it very odd that many uh, conservatives who I thought were believers in free markets um, now want to come in and say, oh, no, no, you can't do that one thing. You, uh, you know, we have to regulate. And in general, I think markets can regulate this for themselves. It's telling to me that every major university has affirmative action programs. Um, you know, if students didn't want them, uh, then I suspect that there would be other schools that would crop up and, you know, and people would gravitate toward those schools. But I think there's a reason why you see so many of our nation's top universities adopting affirmative action programs, not John come lately, but for decades. And the reason is because they want to train their students to be the best possible leaders um, in, our, uh, in, in our diverse uh, country. And so there is a proud educational tradition in this country that treats schooling different, that education is different, it's special, because it teaches Americans how to be full citizens in a pluralistic society. And under a constitution, that has as its core vision, we the people coming together in order to form a more perfect union. E pluribus unum, what does that mean? It means out of many come one. This coming together of Americans in our university settings is a deeply inspiring event to behold and I think it's critical to the future of our nation. Thank you. Well, thank you for your remarks, Neil, and it's wonderful to be here on my first ever visit to Dartmouth and to Hanover. My wife and daughter and I were walking around yesterday, and as we sort of came through campus and up into College Park and got to the statue of Robert Frost that was donated, actually, by Peter's class, uh, I, I turned to my daughter and said, how about, how about Dartmouth for college? And, uh, and I was trying to get her interested, but I'm, I'm ashamed to report to this audience that her heart is still set on Bowdoin. Uh, I will see what I can do. I, I, I want to thank the organizers of this great event, uh, particularly John and Peter for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit and maybe surprise you some. And I want to do my best to uh, start off and reframe the discussion so we're clear about what Neil and I agree and disagree about. Uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says the following, no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. You may not know that fewer than three colleges or universities in America do not accept federal money. So essentially we are talking about every college and university in America is bound by the statute I just read to you. And to everyone here, these words are pretty easy to understand. They express a public policy that no one should be judged based on the color of their skin in the context of higher education, including admissions. That's what we as a nation agreed to in 1964 through an act of our Congress. And actually, we as a people agree with this principle today, even if a majority of people sitting here do not. Uh, according to Pew this year, over 70% of Americans oppose the use of race as a factor in higher education admissions. So if the market is speaking, it speaks in the form of you and me, people answering the phone to Pew, saying we do not agree that universities should use race as a factor in admissions. And I recognize this is not the way people tend to think about race on college and university campuses and in the faculty uh, conference rooms, where every day and in every way, 
There are bombardments about topics like white privilege, intersectionality, other concepts to that effect, where race is not something to be put aside, but is in fact a central obsession. But I don't intend to win this debate by appealing to you to join your fellow 70% of Americans who think race should not be used as a factor of admissions or to engage in some kind of group think or persuasive authority by reference to that. I will win by delivering to you two what I think may be surprises. And surprise one is that I agree with about 90% of what Neil said. Uh, no one thinks, or very few people think, it would be healthy for America for Harvard or Dartmouth or Yale or Princeton to have few or no African Americans on its campus. No one believes that. I don't believe that. Harvard and of course its peers like Dartmouth serve an incredibly important gating function along the lines of what Neil was talking about, but even further, these elite institutions serve an important gating function in our society. A degree from one of these institutions, as many of you know, opens doors. You get to come here or go to Harvard or go to Yale and rub shoulders with future titans of industry, future presidents of the United States even. So we can all have an aversion to these important social vehicles, Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, locking out a minority group or in some way preventing that minority group from achieving those benefits and by supplying benefits to everyone else, as Neil outlined. I think all but the extreme fringes in our society would agree with what I just said, and I agree with Neil. So we're not here to debate whether an all-white Harvard or an all-white Dartmouth is a good or a bad thing. We agree it's bad. We're here to debate whether applicants need to be sorted and judged by their skin color in order to achieve the great benefits of diversity Neil has talked about. Now let me make sure you know what I mean by sorting or judging, and what everyone means by race-based affirmative action in higher education. Uh, Daniel helpfully read out a definition of affirmative action, but the way race-based affirmative action works is uncontroversially and absolutely without dispute as follows. Someone applies to college. Many of you have children or grandchildren that have applied to college. They now use something called the common application. The common application has a space for you to indicate your racial or ethnic background. You check a box that says you are African American. You say nothing else about your race anywhere on your application, but a university uses the fact of your skin color alone, your self-identified skin color, to award you a preference in admissions. It doesn't matter whether you're a student at hyper ritzy Georgetown Day in Washington, D.C., and you happen to have black skin and be African American versus an African American student from my hometown of Chicago who literally dodges bullets on the way to a school that has no books. Those two people are treated the same for purposes of this analysis. They are both awarded a preference based alone on their skin color. I want to make clear, I have no objection to a college or university considering someone's personal history with respect to their race. For instance, whether they've suffered discrimination in the context of university admissions. But that's not what we're talking about. What Students for Fair Admissions is trying to make illegal is considering the mere act of checking a box, the mere fact of someone's skin color. So what's the second surprise? First surprise is I agree with 90% of what Neil said about the benefits of diversity. The second surprise is the, really the important one. None of this skin color preference is necessary to achieve the benefits Neil is talking about. And how do we know that? Well, for decades, we've had universities submitting briefs to the Supreme Court, like Harvard's in the Bakke case that Neil talked about, with abstractions about how important the consideration of race is to their process and how they couldn't get by without it. Well, the good news about a lawsuit against Harvard is they can't deal in self-serving abstractions anymore. And what we managed to get is massive amounts of data. So the court ordered Harvard to produce the copious data it had on its admissions process. And when I say copious, I mean that we ultimately got six years worth of data, 150,000 admissions decisions, about 10,000 admits over a six year period, and incredible amounts of data about each and every one of these students who applied to Harvard, where they went to high school, what the demographics of that high school was, what were their SAT scores, what were their GPAs, what specific extracurriculars did they do, how did Harvard evaluate those extracurriculars, how did Harvard evaluate everything about them? They keep score. We got all that. And what did we find out? We found out that Harvard could stop 
using race, using skin color as a factor in admissions, and still enroll a class that was as racially diverse, was more socioeconomically diverse, and was equally academically prepared. Now, like I said, only the extreme fringes would believe it would be good for Harvard to have few or no African Americans. I don't even know these people. You don't either. I think also only extreme fringes would want Harvard to keep judging people by the color of their skin, to keep awarding an African American from Georgetown Day some kind of benefit in admissions when they've, achieved, they've seen no disadvantage in their life. No one would want Harvard to keep doing that if they could get by without it. So this all sounds so easy, you say. So what's the catch? How, what, why are we here? If, this, if Harvard could stop, why don't they stop? How does Harvard justify what it's doing if everything is the way I say it is? How did we get here to this point in higher ed admissions if there are easy alternatives? Here's how we got here. And on these subjects, I will speak only about Harvard, but I really have no reason to believe it's any different at any of Harvard's peer institutions, particularly in the Ivy League, but also across the country. What, why does Harvard resort to the crude use of a skin color preference in order to enroll a racially diverse class today? It is to offset Harvard's white preferences. Yeah, you heard me. Harvard currently awards massive preferences for recruited athletes, children of its alumni, children of major donors or relations of major donors, and children of its faculty, what we call the ALDC group, athletes, legacies, donors, children of faculty. This group is over 80% white. That's no surprise. Actually, most of the athletes at Harvard are white. Uh, certainly, most of the legacies, obviously, most people went to Harvard still today living are white, and their children are white. Uh, people with money are white, and most of Harvard's faculty, white. So it's no surprise that this group that gets its massive preference is 80% white. They make up uh, just 5% of, of Harvard's applicant pool. And I don't know if anybody wants to guess, 5% of Harvard's applicant pool, what percentage of the entering class do you think? These 80% white, privileged people, children of rich people, children of Harvard alumni, what percentage of Harvard's class do you think they are? 5% of the applicant pool, 30%. They are 30% of Harvard's entering class, this group that receives these preferences. And it gets worse. Of the 30% that we're talking about, this, this white privilege group, which is really what it is, this privileged preference group that's in Harvard's class, three quarters of them, three quarters, would not have been admitted if they'd competed with everybody else. That, that, that is absolutely the analysis that will be coming out in papers that will be peer reviewed as soon as the court issues its decision. This is public record. You can look all of this up in the analysis of the case. Three quarters of them. The size of this ALDC preference has not been getting smaller over time. It's actually been getting bigger. In other words, as it's increasingly the case that this privileged third of, of Harvard's class could not have gotten in without dollars or connections from mommy, daddy, grandpa, or coach. 80% white, 5% of the applicant pool, 30% of the class. And that means about a quarter of the class is de facto set aside today for white faces. And now you know why Harvard claims it needs to be able to resort to skin color preferences. It's gotta balance it out. They've given away a quarter of the seats to whites out of the gate. I told you we proved that Harvard could get to a diverse, racially diverse class without using the skin color preference it uses today. What we actually showed is that all Harvard have to, would have to do is two things. Get rid of the privilege preferences and increase preferences for socioeconomically disadvantaged applicants. The first one's easy to understand. All of a sudden, 25% of the seats that have been reserved for whites through privilege preferences are open. The second one is also pretty easy to get. Socioeconomic advantage is not evenly distributed by race in America, we all know that. Racial minorities are disproportionately disadvantaged. Those two things would have Harvard with the exact same, very similar racial diverse class, 1% uh, drop in average SATs, I think they could probably deal with a 1% drop in the average SATs, and far, far greater socioeconomic diversity. So the very wealthy African-American kid that I keep referring to who goes to Georgetown Day no longer receives a preference, but maybe my, my near neighbor in Chicago 
who, for, who through all adversity, gets a decent score on the SAT, gets through that school where there weren't even any books or was chronically underfunded, he gets a big benefit irrespective of his skin color. That's the system we proposed. That's the one Harvard could use. That's the one Harvard doesn't want to use. This is not a battle about whether Harvard should be racially diverse. It's a battle about whether these privileged preferences are justified or could ever justify a race-based admission system. Harvard cannot justify these preferences to the American public. They are morally repugnant. Maybe another 70% winner with the American public will ask Pew, is that Congress should ban legacy and donor preferences in college admissions. Maybe somebody in Congress who claims to care about the 99% should propose such a ban, just like we have in Title VI, a ban on race discrimination. That ban would overnight end the false perceived need for race-based affirmative action at elite campuses across the country. Of that, I'm sure. How important are these privileged preferences to Harvard? Well, they refuse to give them up, and they decide they have to use skin color preferences to make up the balance. But as Harvard's non-ALDC applications have gone up, the quality of those non-ALDC applications has gone up, and Harvard has responded to that by increasing the size of its ALDC preference. In other words, as the quality of the rest of the pool gets better and better and better, Harvard makes sure they're still gonna have 30% of the class as an ALDC component. What else did Harvard do? Harvard committed a horrible crime against young Americans who happened to be Asian and discriminated against them in admissions. Asian Americans are our fastest growing immigrant group. They too would like to participate in the American dream. And one dream that some people have in America is to go to Harvard, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Asian, Americans, uh, Asian American applicants to Harvard and I can assure you this is true of applicants to Dartmouth College and to peer institutions, blow away white applicants on every metric. Whether it's the GPA in high school or the SATs or whether they're national merit scholars, but they also blow them away on extracurriculars. We know this from the Harvard database. They, they absolutely destroy comparable white applicants, SATs, academics, extracurriculars, everything. But what did Harvard, what did he see at Harvard? For decades, for about 15 years, there were no increases in Asian numbers at Harvard proportionally, even as Asian Americans were dramatically going up as, as largest growing immigrant group, higher up college applications. And what happened is David Brooks in late 2013 drew attention to uh, a piece that had been written by a guy called Ron Unz, who's a Harvard graduate, <clears throat> in, the, in, a, in a magazine, few read, called American Conservative. And, uh, Mr. Unz had some, some wild ideas, but amongst the things that he said was that Harvard was discriminating against Asians and he could prove it from public data. Uh, David Brooks picked this up, and what then happened is, because people do read the New York Times, uh, Harvard's admissions office started to get lots of calls, lots of interest in what was this true or how are we gonna respond to this? Both sides, some just reflexively defending Harvard, others asking questions, and uh, here's what happened. Uh, Harvard's admissions office went into a near panic mode. They consulted Harvard's Office of Institutional Research, which is an internal arm of Harvard dedicated to studying Harvard itself. Uh, Harvard, <laughs> Harvard uh, uses <clears throat> these PhDs to collect data and crunch numbers for the federal government, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, the admissions office asked them to conduct a study. They got 10 years of admissions data, even more than we had and did a, an analysis similar to the one that we did, crunched all the numbers and submitted to Dean of Admissions Bill Fitzsimmons a memo. And the memo said at the end, we give preferences to athletes, we give preferences to legacies, we give large preferences to African Americans, Native Americans and Hispanics, we give preferences to small ones for today, to socioeconomically disadvantaged folk, and there is a penalty in our process for Asian Americans. And at the end of the memo, there was some guidance for Dean Fitzsimmons. It said, please don't release this publicly <laughs> because the size of the preferences we're awarding for legacies and athletes may be embarrassing. And also there are demographic groups that have negative effects. And the only demographic group with a negative effect in that formal memorandum he received are Asians. And so 
you would think if anybody working in any business, if Neil or I at my law firm, at our law firms respectively, got a memo saying we crunch the numbers and we're discriminating against Asian Americans or African Americans in our employment practices, I, I know, I, I just met Neil for the first time today and I know what he would do. He would run off to management. He would say we have to do something. He would say we need more analysis. He would say I'm worried. This is surprising to me. Dean Fitzsimmons told absolutely nobody about that memo. He conducted no further analysis. He asked for no further work. He did not tell the director of admissions, Marlon McGrath, who he'd been working with for over three decades about these findings. He told no one. Harvard did nothing. That was before we sued them. That is not the act of someone who believes themselves to be innocent. That is not the act of someone who cares about whether there's a problem. They didn't care. Dean Fitzsimmons didn't care that Harvard was discriminating against Asian Americans. And the main mechanism by which they do so, by the way, is that I told you Asian Americans were better on academics and extracurriculars and everything that matters to getting into Harvard except one thing, which is Harvard uses something called a personal rating, which is the Harvard Admissions Office assessment of how likable, vivacious, interesting you are. And Asian Americans were systematically awarded lower personal ratings than white applicants. Yes, absolutely. Things would get written on the docket, seems quiet. Of course, wants to be a doctor. <laughs> Racial stereotypes deployed against Asian American applicants. Racial stereotypes are bad no matter where they're found. It doesn't matter that Asian Americans are the so-called model minority and they're doing so great because they're 5% of the population and at the time were about 18 or 20% of the population at Harvard. That doesn't excuse deploying racist stereotypes against individual kids who've done nothing wrong and maybe they aren't quiet. Why are you assuming that? Maybe, they'd, maybe they'll change their mind about wanting to be a doctor. And what's wrong with wanting to be a doctor? I think Dan told me his dad was a doctor. There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> this is what happens when you give people the tool of skin color preferences. They are allowed to preserve that which they're embarrassed about, these privileged preferences. They're allowed to engage in penalties against vulnerable and immigrant minority groups like Asian Americans. It's not just Harvard, though. In the University of Michigan case that Neil referred to, a Michigan administrator was heard to remark, that Cubans shouldn't get any affirmative action because they're Republicans. In Students for Fair Admissions litigation against the University of North Carolina, cavalier and frankly gross statements are made about race. Let's give these brown babies a chance. That's a direct quote from documents Students for Fair Admissions obtained from the University of North Carolina. It's high time we stopped trusting higher ed's assurances that race-based preferences are needed the Harvard litigation has proven that one of our nation's best colleges has lied through its teeth about this for decades. Ashamed of its privileged preferences, Harvard hid the truth that its decision to set aside a quarter of its class for white faces is what created the false need for affirmative action. Even worse, it led Harvard to deploy awful racial stereotypes and impose an admissions penalty on Asian American applicants. It is time for this to stop it is time for privileged preferences to end and for the toxic weapon of race discrimination to be eliminated from higher ed admissions, just like Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to both our speakers for really provocative uh, uh, presentations. Um, as the only Harvard grad on the stage, I'm going to leave now. Um, but I would like to, uh, before I go, uh, ask a few questions um, to, uh, to both speakers. And I think um, I'm going to start with Adam. So, Dr. Johnson once uh, described a group of poets, the, the metaphysicals, as people who yoked, extreme, yoked extremes uh, with great violence. 
So that might be an overstatement, but isn't linking the, uh, the privilege cases that you talk about and the anti-Asian bias, um, couldn't you imagine detaching them? And shouldn't an institution, a private institution, have uh, the latitude to decide that, yes, there, it does want to uh, have a bonus for legacies, never mind the fact that legacies are usually likely to have uh, pretty, uh, pretty good students in, in their families, or isn't it a, a legitimate thing for an institution to say, yes, uh, we are gonna continue to grow, and there isn't something really all that horrible about letting in a qualified student whose father may or mother may um, you know, build a building here somewhere down the line. Um, a little bit of devil's advocacy here, but nonetheless, um, it seems to me, first of all, that those things are all a lot more defensible than what we have seen in, uh, in the recent scandal. Um, the Harvard Law professor, uh, Jeannie Suk Gerson, wrote in The New Yorker, I believe, that um, the problem was not affirmative action, in her view, it was anti-Asian bias. So I'm throwing out a few different thoughts for you, but I guess one of the key issues here, which Neil raised before, is what is the um, sphere of autonomy for uh, elite private institutions? I have, I have so many thoughts about that. First of all, Jeannie actually came to the trial every day, so I had a, a great chance to talk to her almost every day about her views uh, on the subject, and I read the piece you're talking about. I think you're asking sort of two questions. One is, what's legal? And the other is, what's moral? So I'll answer the second question first. No, I, I, I just, I firmly disagree. It is, when, when these institutions occupy the place that they have in our society, it is not right to buy access to them. It is not right to have access to them by virtue of one's birth. This is not England. This is America. These, these institutions are, should be the vehicle of social change and social mobility. I, I mean, I sound like a progressive when I say these things. I assure you I am not one. <laughs> but I, I, I think normatively, morally, it is wrong to award these preferences. I, 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 I gather your, some of your question is directed at the fact that as somebody who's generally skeptical of government, and as Neil pointed out, why should I be really riding high on the idea of more government intervention? And, and I do have some reticence of, on that subject, but I, I, I just don't see any other way. There's sort of two vehicles by which Harvard is going to change, and I'll pick on Harvard, but really it's the same everywhere. Yeah, go for it. Um, there's two vehicles by which Harvard's gonna change. One is really what I would like, which is for, for Congress, for us as a people, to just say no more to the pay for play uh, or, or by virtue of birth admissions game. And if we did that, I'm pretty convinced that Harvard's fidelity to its progressive ideals and to diversity would result in Harvard dramatically reducing the privilege preferences and increasing socioeconomic preferences in the way that we outlined. That's one way to get to where I think we should be. The other way is for the United States Supreme Court to overrule its previous decisions and to declare affirmative action illegal under Title VI and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Because I guarantee you if that happens, Harvard will lower its privileged preferences and increase its socioeconomic preferences. In other words, Harvard's gonna do the same thing either route we take. To answer a piece of your question, yes, I think you can disaggregate the Asian discrimination problem from the ALDC or the privilege preferences. Harvard didn't. I mean, the same memo says we're embarrassed about this and we should be worried about that. <clears throat> I don't know whether every uh, elite institution in America uh, discriminated intentionally against Asian American applicants. I really hope it's not true. The Ivy League for a while was like gas stations across the street from one another on the percentage of Asian uh, enrollment, but I don't know how the applicant pools differ amongst the Ivy League institutions, and I don't have the data. Um, I find it a little bit hard to believe that Harvard was the only one doing this, uh, but if we have it our way, and if Judge Burroughs agrees, they will be the last one. 
do you want to uh, respond to those, uh, or should I ask you a wholly different question? No, I'm happy to. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so first of all, I told you all that I don't particularly care what happens at Harvard. I maintain that position entirely. Um, we're here to debate affirmative action nationwide, and Adam's goal is actually to get rid of it nationwide. He's not just talking about Harvard. So I'd be very cautious about accepting the data, which I'm, I'm not sure necessarily may, may support what he's saying. It may not with respect to Harvard. But um, I think it's a very, very dangerous thing to model a debate or public policy on the basis of one institution, and particularly the advocate of one institution, I haven't been an advocate for institutions, uh, and what, what he's saying. And, and that's particularly true about Harvard, because Harvard, of course, does occupy a unique niche in our society. They could get rid of all sorts of things and still attract the very, very top minority students um, in the country. It's like for me, you know, I run uh, one of the two best Supreme Court practices. I could tomorrow say I'm not going to take any graduates of Harvard and Yale Law Schools um, and still have very little of a hit to the amazing applicants that I'm going to get in my program because, uh, you know, people are going to come and because of our name and, and reputation. Uh, that isn't as true about other universities. And so what goes for Harvard may not go for the rest of society and the rest of higher education. And we have to be worried about devising public policy on the basis of outlier examples. I mean, you know, the McDonald's coffee cup example 20 years ago is a really good illustration. Someone like it's burned by hot coffee and sues for $4 million and all of a sudden the entire country freaks out and uh, about tort liability and enacts all these damages caps and the like. The fact is those lawsuits are one in a million and, uh, and don't, aren't you Usually successful. So yes, I think if there's a problem at Harvard, absolutely address the problem at Harvard. I'm glad the lawsuit is proceeding and whatever should happen there. But just because there's one affirmative action program that's bad doesn't make them all bad. Indeed, the University of Michigan program that he's talking about where that one person said Cubans are, shouldn't get affirmative action because they're Republicans, that program was struck down. I support that. I just don't think that's true about the lion's share of affirmative action in this country, and that's why you see university after university, company after company, military leader after military leader, all saying, we need this. Now, Adam says, oh, well, you could do this another way. You could get rid of these privilege preferences, and that'll do it. Um, I'm skeptical of this for a whole number of reasons. Number one, if you want to, if that's your goal, if that's your crusade, you know, go for it. Go, go just attack those preferences for those things. That's not what you're doing. You're also coming in and saying you can't have affirmative action. I would say start with that. Go to, you know, the admissions office here and at Harvard and other places and try and persuade them to get rid of athletic admissions and, uh, uh, and legacy and donors and things like that. See where that gets you. And I'd like to see the data then. But I don't believe the data will support what you're saying. After all, you just said you want to get rid of donor preferences. You think that uh, you know education should be available to all and shouldn't be for sale and the things you said. But the whole point, and I'm not a defender of this, but I think the whole point of big donors having some preferences when they build buildings and the like is because it lowers the tuition cost for everyone and makes it easier for poorer students to attend those universities. So if you get rid of that, there's going to be a hit on the socioeconomic side, and somehow that's got to be made up. And I want to make sure that these studies you're talking about uh, actually support the, what you're saying. I know that, for example, your own expert, Richard Kallenberg, said if you did socioeconomic diversity, it wouldn't be enough, that Harvard would go from 14% African-American to 9% African-American. Yes, the dark days of 2014 at Harvard when it was that percent African-American. This, this, this is just total nonsense. Rick supports everything that we are saying. He uh, testified that African-Americans would drop by a couple percent back to what it, it looked like quote, in 2014. He said it wouldn't be, quote, sufficient, a sufficient number. That's back, back when it was, back, back at the same level it was in the terrible old days of 2014. I don't know about, twi I mean, 2014 or now. I mean, the point is that study after study shows that you need some affirmative action in order to get those numbers. Indeed, when University of California had that proposition to abolish affirmative action, minority enrollments dropped in half. That, now, that's, a really, that's a really good point, actually. 
because there was no concomitant effort on the socioeconomic side. Whereas when, the, when Texas was disallowed from using affirmative action for quite some time, the Texas legislature enacted a relatively crude form of socioeconomic preference called the Top 10% Plan, which allowed Texas to maintain a rough approximation, same levels of diversity. What you need to have is concomitant socioeconomic preferences. I haven't yet heard the justification for a skin color preference for an African-American student at Georgetown Day. I would like to hear it. So, so first of all, if I can finish, um, the, uh, the, the 10% plan itself, I think, proves my point. Imagine this, you have the flagship university, the University of Texas, and they take all the top students from around the country and in the state, and then the legislature comes in and says, well, we're gonna treat the top 10% of every high school equally in the state. Now, maybe there's a market that demands that, I don't know, but I would think that if, the, if you're gonna do that, you shouldn't do it under the threat of the gun of, of a federal court order. Instead, you know, adopt that policy if you really think that's what your flagship university should be. My general view is that schools are different in different places, and that ninth percent kid at one school is not the same as the ninth percent kid at the other, and I don't wanna have some sort of flat policy that just treats everyone all the same without thinking about it. And by the way, I don't think that affirmative action is done as just skin color, no. I mean, maybe that's what your evidence at Harvard shows, I don't know, you, you're, you're the expert on that, but you know, I, I've dealt with a lot of affirmative action programs and I'm heavily involved in one Ivy League one, and I can tell you that I think that it's done far, far more individualistically, the way that Justice Powell envisioned in Baki. Yes, skin color is included as one preference among many, just like for flute players or chess players or athletes, which is another form of diversity. But I don't think it's like what's going on is that, oh, you check a box, you're a minority, and you get in. Of course not. If that were so, it would defeat the whole point of the program. And to the extent it is occurring somewhere in some outlier place, and maybe Harvard's an outlier place, that's a problem with that program. It's not a problem with the whole thing. Okay, so I want to um, move the conversation just for a moment from uh, my alma mater to uh, my employer. And, um, <clears throat> and I do so, uh, uh, as you can imagine, at some peril, but uh, it seems to me that it's worth bringing up. Dartmouth uh, has a particular commitment uh, to uh, bring Native Americans to the college, and that stems from our history as a, uh, a school that began as a missionary school that was meant to uh, preach the gospel here in the in the wilderness uh, under President Kemeny, I believe it was in 1970 when he was uh, when he came into office. He uh, renewed Dartmouth's commitment uh, to the Native American community, and as a result, Dartmouth has uh, had more Native American students, I believe, over the last uh, 40 years than all the rest of the Ivies put together. If I've read our own uh, website correctly. Um, is this uh, not a permissible program as, as far as you're concerned? I think probably not under Title VI. I mean, I, I don't see, you know, and, 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 you know, God rest his soul, Justice Stevens agreed with me about Title VI and the Baki decision that on its face it prohibits such things. Now, whether Congress should act to make an exception for something along the lines of what you're talking about, I think is, is worthy of debate, particularly given our nation's history. Uh, with Native Americans, but we, our nation also has a, a, a pretty dark history with respect to other minority groups as well. And I, I fear that the exception will swallow the rule. Also, to just get back to something about you know this being you wanted to move it away from Harvard, and, and you know, it's just a personal I, thing. I, no, I understand. I, we have the data from Harvard. I have no reason to believe it's different anywhere else. And and in fact, it should be the burden should be on the, the universities to tell us why they need these things and to demonstrate it conclusively with proof and not with bromides and briefs. And I, I've got to say, just saying trust us, we need this, is not enough. Frankly, these people are liars. I mean, that is what has happened. That's what happened at Harvard, and I have no reason to believe, and the presumption should be, it is happening elsewhere. I fully agree with Neil on, on one thing. It might be true 
that at some universities, uh, they cannot get to where they are today using race neutral means. It might be the case. That could be true. I don't think it's true at any of our elite institutions. Um, and I would be fine if my proposed congressional legislation was limited to colleges and universities with endowments over a billion dollars. Uh, as to the Prop 209 point in, in the Texas 10% plan, I, I don't really have much to criticize about the Texas 10% plan. I think it was a crude thing. But one interesting thing is the same, the same debate came up with the SAT adversity score. And I, many of you probably read about the proposed SAT adversity score. And what the College Board is really doing there is they're getting everybody ready for a post-affirmative action world. They're, they want to supply their consumers, which are the universities, who some of whom are rejecting the SAT because of its racially disparate results. They want to supply them with a product that's going to enable them to enroll a diverse class without using race. And that's what the adversity score is. And I'm a big proponent of it. And what's amazing to me is conservatives went out on TV and said, this is terrible. This is just another way to disguise affirmative action. And I went on TV and said, this is great. This is the kind of tool that, that, that colleges and universities really need. Not Harvard, by the way, because Harvard's 40 full-time admissions staff, they know every high school in this country. They know every teacher, every guidance counselor, every possible thing. But at Washington University in St. Louis, admissions is done by temporary graduate students who receive a half day of training. And they, they don't know everything. And what the college board's proposing to do is going to be really, really, really helpful. And, and by the way, the comment I make about Wash U proves why it's exactly it is the skin color and why UNC can say, let's get those brown babies in here. And this, these, are not, these are not isolated incidents. This is going on everywhere. Our common sense tells us it is. But with the, once somebody said to me about the adversity score, won't this cause people to move into disadvantaged high schools so they can get a boost to, to get into Harvard and Dartmouth and Yale? And I said, great. <laughs> wow. If people want to move and people want to integrate and they want to do that to get a leg up in college admissions, I'm all for it. So um, two things uh, on the Title VI point. Title VI bans discrimination. And my whole point to you, and I think it's been the policy of the Supreme Court for at least a quarter century, is that affirmative action, when done right, when following the precepts of the Bakke plan, is not discrimination. Indeed, that is what Justice Stevens himself concluded in the Grutter case in 2003. And it seems a little bit odd to me to think that the Congress in 1964 was thinking about prohibiting affirmative action. I, I see no evidence of that in the legislative history. And I think Professor Benjamin's point about Native Americans is a really deep one. And I'll just make this very personal. You know, Dartmouth was the first place that I met Native Americans. And, um, and I'm pretty sure without the commitment that the school has had, that wouldn't have happened. Um, and that's why you see the numbers at Dartmouth vis-a-vis -vis the other Ivy League schools. And that opened my eyes in profound, profound ways. I mean, today I run a Supreme Court practice that's the leaders in defending Native American tribes. And we win these cases five to four at the Supreme Court, and we are changing the path of American jurisprudence. And I dare say that would not have happened were it not for the experience I had here at Dartmouth when I learned about this. And, you know, And I'm really worried about my friend Adam's characterization, these people are liars, um, which I find derogatory, and I think we should presume good faith on at least, you know, you can talk about Harvard folk, you know, you know Harvard, but you know, you're talking about thousands of university administrators who after all haven't done what I've done and others and you know, gone to the private sector. They're there for a reason because they believe in the educational mission. And this isn't just, you know, it's, it's not, so, it would be a, the oddest of coincidences that you have university administrator after university of administrator, university president after university president, military leader after military leader, Fortune 100 CEO to Fortune 100 CEO all saying we need this. Now, I guess they all could be wrong and liars, but I guess I'm going to presume a little good faith and think that the market here is saying something. And again, if you want to convince the market otherwise, that's great. Go and debate this and say why it's wrong and convince universities not to do it. But what you're doing is going in and using the power of the federal courts 
to preempt that democratic discussion that we should be having in rooms like this? So um, I'm getting the signal to um, take the two of you backstage and maybe get out a hose or something, but um, <laughs> calm things down just a little. But I do have one more question um, that I want to put to both of you, uh, because uh, your discussion um, I've, I found really illuminating, um, and, but this is a layman's question to two uh, high-powered attorneys, which is that we talk about affirmative action in terms of promoting the forward-looking uh, virtue of diversity. And I was uh, at one point trained as a historian, briefly anyway, and um, I want to ask the question of whether we as a society shouldn't also have uh, the option to see uh, affirmative action and to employ it as a way of redressing uh, wrongs done in our own history and that um, you know I think most of us believe should be in some way addressed. Now, unfortunately, uh, at the macro level, uh, that may involve preferences, um, but it may also be in our interest as a nation to have a, a more perfect union, as you mentioned before. So if I can get really short answers from the two of you on that one, uh, we can take a break, we can collect some questions, and uh, you know, we can come back out uh, refreshed. So. Uh, would you like to go first, Adam? Sure, and I, I, I need to make clear that when I speak on uh, occasionally, uh, like when I say that privileged preferences should be banned by Congress, uh, and when I answer this question, I am not speaking for Students for Fair Admissions. I'm speaking on my own behalf, as I've been really this entire time. Uh, I personally don't think the, the Constitution should be interpreted to ban such things. Um, I personally think it should be open to our Congress to permit uh, such remedial uh, measures if we as a people decide, acting through our Congress, to deploy them. Um, and so, do I think we should do such things? I, I, think, I think it's a very difficult question. Uh, I assume Neil will have a, a perfectly pithy response. I, I do think that it's funny that the guy on the right is the one who wants big government, and the guy on the left believes the military corporatist uh, industrial complex and everything that they say. It's, it's important to be flexible in your, in, in your mind, so, yeah. I, I think it's a hard question. I think that reparations, again, you have some of those logical stopping point things and other things that we talked about. I'll tell you, I think the best case, it's, a, it's one that affects my own u university, Georgetown, in which we've recently learned that the university, uh, uh, sadly, had a number of slaves um, that, uh, that worked for the school and uh, that were bequeathed to it, um, and um, you know that's a uh, that's a way in which you know I think I can see a very strong argument that the university's got to do something to make up for that particular uh, injustice. Um, and I think more generally, the debate about reparations in our society is one that should be, that we really need to have. Um, and I think there's really excellent writing on this uh, on both sides. I don't actually know where I come out, my, but wherever I come out, I think the university is not actually as important to the reparations piece as other parts in general. Obviously, there are examples in which universities themselves were very complicit in this. Even given the obvious um, you know, historical legacies in terms of economic deprivation, discrimination, segregation, and the like? Yeah, no, I think that there's something there. I mean, you know, one problem is just realistically, legally, it's all foreclosed, and I don't see that changing. So basically, the Supreme Court has made it impossible to have a reparations-based affirmative action policy. You've got to do it through diversity, um, and so I don't, I don't think we'll see it. Um, and then as a theoretical matter, um, again, I can see the arguments, um, but I do see the cost sometimes being higher with reparations. Okay, um, let's take a break. We'll be back at 10.45, is that correct? Or 11? 10.45, don't go away. Before we get started with the q and I, I want to bring your attention to our Osher Fall Catalog. There is a course being offered this fall entitled The Problem of Selective College Admissions, Building a Class. And it's being, the study leader is Louis Greenstein, which I understand is in the, in the house today. 
and looking at uh, Adams ADLC group, uh, people, uh, visitors to this class will include President Phil Hanlon, Carl Furstenberg, the former Vice Provost for Admissions and Financial Aid, and Harry Sheehy, the Athletic Director. So we've taken care of the athletics, the legacies, and the class. And Lewis, I suggest you try to get somebody from Dartmouth College Fund to come. <laughs> Okay, well, we're all back, and I hope you're all refreshed. And now we have some uh, of your questions to put to our speakers. Um, as you know, we're broadcasting to a number of different universities around the country, so I'm going to start off uh, with one from the University of Kentucky, which also is echoed by a, a question uh, from someone in the audience. Um, and this one, I think, uh, should go first to Adam. It seems to me that Harvard's discrimination against Asians resulted from an anti-Asian bias. How does ruling out uh, preferences such as legacies, donors, etc., stop that bias? Wouldn't it be as effective to require a preference for Asian applicants? And uh, relatedly, uh, relatedly, uh, other other uh, another questioner asks, um, you know, if uh, we were to go in the uh, direction that you have suggested, um, you know, Harvard, uh, I, and I'm going to editorialize here, God forbid, I think this, this uh, questioner is saying, Harvard would become like MIT. Um, uh, but more specifically, uh, the question is, Harvard would become like M MIT, or you could say Berkeley or any number of other schools with over 50% Asian students. Um, is, that, is that what we want? I'll start with the, the second question first, which is a response I've received sometimes as I've gone around the country uh, talking about this and, and, and occasionally revealed you know, my role in the SFFA case at, at, a, at a bar in Palm Beach, for instance. I got, um, no, I do not care if Harvard becomes 50% Asian. Um, it might mean that my Chinese uh, nephews or nieces were admitted. So, so eat it, is my answer. Uh, on, on the other question, um, there's a couple pieces. It, the, the, the problem with Asian discrimination, and I had a great opportunity during the break to speak to somebody in the audience who, uh, who wanted to talk to me about how it maybe got, came to pass. That, that the Asian discrimination happened at Harvard. And I wanted to, to you know, in, in response a little bit to, to something that Neil said too, say, I think the way it came to pass is, effectively, the Harvard admissions office was deploying racial stereotypes, and many of them may have not even known that they were doing so. And when it came to their attention through publicity about this case, that they were systematically awarding Asians lower personal ratings, uh, what, what Harvard did right before the trial was dramatically alter their reading procedures in a way that they later admitted, their witnesses admitted, was designed to combat this stereotyping. So I think Harvard did take a step to try to remedy the problem. It had nothing to do with the ALDC piece, uh, nothing whatsoever. And I think it can probably be remedied without taking away the privilege preferences. And it probably just requires additional training and focus for them not to be imposing the Asian penalty and they could keep the other uh, race preferences. I do not think we need an Asian preference at Harvard. Uh, you, you, you know, they're, they're gonna be fine without, without a, a, a preference being awarded. I, I guess I'd say uh, we have bigger, we have a large problem in higher ed admissions, I think. Uh, it's the pay-for-play system that Varsity Blues has sort of, is sort of the apotheosis of that. Uh, we have a problem of skin color preferences with really, and, and Neil and I just disagree about how they're implemented. He thinks it's this, you know, special snowflake, everybody gets a lot of attention, and I think it's temp graduate students saying, bring me these, you know, brown babies, and, and maybe the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, but I, 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 I don't care if Harvard becomes 50% Asian. Maybe that means my Chinese nephews got in, nieces too. And uh, I don't think we should have an Asian preference. And, and as you all know, I don't care about Harvard. Um, <laughs> and uh, I hope they become like MIT, it'd be a step up. 
Um, so, but, but I am worried about the Asian American issue, um, and, and I think what Adam has done in his litigation is bring something to light, um, which is important. And um, I, I've never thought affirmative action programs should be justified in the shadows. Um, I think the data should be out there, and we should know what it is. And, and then we can make an informed market decision accordingly. I don't like hiding behind platitudes uh, and saying, uh, you know, without giving, you know, actual data. And so I think what Adam's done is important. I don't personally think it reflects, like, intentional discrimination against Asians, what's going on at Harvard. I think that it reflects an unconscious bias, a view that, oh, Asians aren't as well-rounded, um, or, or something like that. And one reason I'm such a believer in affirmative action-based diversity in higher education is to break down those stereotypes, one of which is to look at just the overall number of Asians. Um, there's such a diversity in the Asian American population, whether it's poor Hmong, you know, from Vietnam, or you know, relatively wealthier folks from China, or whatever. And so, um, you know, I, that's why I think affirmative action, when it's done right, focuses on the individual characteristics of which skin color is a part, but only a part. I, I, I now agree with 100% of what he said. <laughs> well, this is what we've been aiming for. Um, That's not going to be any fun. What are we going to do for the next half yeah, hour? Well, <clears throat> maybe not Harvard bashing. Okay. Um, so here's uh, such I a good target. Follow. I've got all day. Yeah. Um, so uh, a, a follow-up question: um, What does research show uh, are the outcomes of minority students who gain admission uh, through affirmative action? Um, the the questioner. Uh, then asks about uh, graduation rates. I'm not sure if that is the appropriate indicator or about success after graduation, but uh, what can we say about the utility of the program in terms of socioeconomic outcomes? So I only have a little bit of data on this. I know there's a, you know, a lot of literature and um, a lot of it's cited in the various briefs in, most, in the most recent round at the Supreme Court, Fisher versus University of Texas. But to just give you a few snippets, there's uh, one landmark study by Richard of financial companies. And Richard looks at the rate of diversity in the workforce and how much it positively correlates with an increase in profits and finds that companies do do very well with a diverse workforce, financial companies in particular, because it allows them to expand uh, to new markets. There's um, uh, other studies that show, like, just in brainstorming, just you put psychologists, put people in rooms, and you ask them if they're racially diverse, you know, in racially homogenous brainstorming groups versus others, and you find a far greater increase in um, uh, quality ideas and quantity of ideas in the diverse groups. The interesting one about the jury box, uh, 2006 Tufts study, finds that uh, in sex assault cases, that racially diverse uh, juries tend to found, um, tend to make fewer errors recalling relevant information and displayed a, a greater openness dis toward discussing the role of race and gender in the case. Um, and indeed, just the mere presence of African-American jurors sitting aside white jurors made the groups more open-minded and fastidious. Um, there's a study done by Harvard Graduate School of Education by Leah Schaefer showing that uh, students uh, from graduate schools uh, and undergrads with affirmative action programs have more positive attitudes towards racial minorities, report greater cognitive capacities, and participate in more civic activities. Um, there was a study done of Harvard Medical School and uh, UCSF Medical School, 84% of them saying classroom diversity had tremendously increased their learning experience, 3% said that it had negatively Im impacted it. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other studies about implicit bias and the like. Um, so again, I don't want to rest on studies alone. To me, the big telling indicator is the fact that so many of our nation's top universities have on their own adopted these programs. So just to be clear, my, ver my view is not that affirmative action is constitutionally compelled. I don't think that it is that a university has to do it. 
I think they can do it. It's permissible. A court shouldn't, in, as long as it's adhering to the precepts I said, a court shouldn't strike it down. But so too, the students, the faculty, the administration can say, hey, we're not going to do that. And I think there are a couple schools that operate that way, and that's absolutely fine. And then students can decide, do they want to go to a program that has an affirmative a school with an affirmative action program or not? I just think it's a bad idea to have the courts involved, at least when we're dealing with private decision making by universities. Um, so the, the question I think was, was somewhat directed at sort of following through the, you know, the alleged beneficiaries of affirmative action and seeing how they perform, uh, somewhat identifying what's been associated in, in, the, in the literature with the, I think, mismatch hypothesis uh, most, uh, 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 most, most associated with a guy called Rick Sander out at UCLA. And one of the problems with even asking that question is to go back to Neil's point about transparency, is there's a, there's a, a reluctance bordering on paranoia and fear of uh, the higher ed establishment to allow that type of research. And uh, actually, you know, Professor Sanders engaged in litigation, I think, with the California Bar to try to get data from the California Bar. I don't really know what's going on out there, but there's a real reluctance to allow for serious study in this regard, which is suggestive, maybe, of what serious study would produce, but not proof of what serious study would produce. And I, I think uh, people would feel maybe a little bit differently about affirmative action if we had that information, if it went one way or the other. I will say this on the, on, all, again, all Neil's points are great points, um, except for the thing about we should let private actors do what they want when Title VI says what it says. We just disagree about what Title VI says. Um, I, I, I went to this education summit put on by the Atlantic Magazine recently, and I met this fellow who uh, shares my first name, who's uh, it's Adam, uh, whose last name I can't remember, African-American guy writes for the Atlantic, and uh, he told me that something I didn't know, which is that the historically black colleges and universities of America produce 80% of the black doctors and 50% of the black lawyers. Yeah, how diverse are they? Well, that actually raises uh, another one of the uh, very good questions we've gotten from the audience, which is, should we continue to have all black colleges uh, uh, or colleges that are just for women or in colleges that are, um, you know, religiously oriented? Do you see uh, any issue there? Um, <clears throat> absolutely, as to the HBCUs. Um, I, I, my eyes were really opened by this article and this gentleman, uh, I'm not doing the disservice of misremembering his last name or not remembering it. Uh, I did not know that. Um, HBCUs are a very important part of our uh, higher ed establishment. Uh, the historic, uh, I think the unique history behind them is an important one to remember and recognize. And uh, I, would, I would never say that we should, we should somehow uh, get rid of them or whatever. On the single sex thing, I, I'm not going to get into the. I, 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 I really can't. I don't. I don't want to think. I want to enter that battle. Um, and on the religious one, I, you know, it's funny. Again, during the break, I got an opportunity to give another detail about the Harvard case, which I, was one I love. Um, on the Common App, you're allowed to fill out your religious affiliation. I'm Muslim. You know, I'm Catholic or whatever. And I riffed this with one of the witnesses during the trial and said, you know, my three best friends from college were a Pakistani Muslim, a, a Gujarati uh, Hindu, and a Filipino Catholic. And I said, what did you think was more important to me? You know, the color of their skin or the fact that these were the first Muslim, first Hindu guy I ever met, and the Catholic guy became my confirmation sponsor when I converted to the church. What's more important? His wife's my daughter's godmother. And, you know, I got... Obviously, the religion is very important too, but Harvard deletes that information uh, from the applications. They don't look at it because they don't they don't use it. And when I put it to them that this was insane, because anybody who cared about diversity would also care about religious diversity, which Neil's nodding. They said, "Oh, Massachusetts law 
prevents us from considering religion in admissions. The very same law also prevents consideration of race, by the way. Um, and so when we go to the religious schools, we don't have Title VI for religion. Um, should we have something like that? I would say no. So, um, Adam, don't you, doesn't your position, though, require you to say single-sex educations are illegal under Title VI? Um, I mean... No, it's race, color, and national origin, so we oh, don't have, title, so we so don't have, we don't have Title VI for, Got it. for sex. Got it. I, I, ask me again after the Equality Act passes. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I better shut up. Yeah. So, um, I would again let higher let, let let historically black universities exist, um, and I think they do serve a function, particularly um, for folks who uh, you know I think you know, historically will want to attend those institutions. Maybe uh, uh, maybe they can't socioeconomically or aspirationally think past you know where whatever those schools are. So I wouldn't want to take that option away from them. But it is in tension with my general view, which is that I like the fact that universities bring people together of all walks of life. And yes, absolutely, to me, that includes religion. I, I find it, and, and it includes political diversity, too. I mean, I'm very concerned about the where our universities are going in terms of the, you know, the, the dearth of conservatives, uh, you know, which starts at the faculty level but then goes to the student population as well. And so I think any program that has a firm of action in it on the basis of race, darn well better be thinking about political and religious diversity too, because as Adam says, you know, those are important components of a college experience. You know, I want to add one point. Neil made a very, very good point about the state of play at, in, in our campuses. You know, whatever you think of Rick Sander, he has come under just extraordinary attacks for, for just having a viewpoint on this subject. And, and, and maybe he's said it the wrong way or he's done something to offend somebody and maybe he's in some sense, uh, uh, you know, kick the, the, the bee's nest. But we can't live in a world where, where, where people who are, are critical of this or conservatives are, are going to come under attack. And, and, and you know, the story that I have not told publicly, I'll tell right now, is my wife who was sitting here earlier with our daughter uh, did not want me to take the case. And she didn't want me to take the case because I'd done some politically high profile stuff in the past and received some death threats and things of that nature, and she thought it was going to be that all over again. One interesting thing, maybe it's about that 70% pew thing or something, is that I've received absolutely no uh, negative feedback uh, about the case, and all I do is get emails and letters and You want cards. some? No, no I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean of the, of the sort of, you know, you're an awful person, how dare you? I mean, I guess I've been called a white supremacist or something, whatever, but, but the, the, I have not received that, and instead, what I've gotten, and I think this is the reason why Neil so you know, really wants to get away from Harvard, is everybody wants to believe it's just Harvard. They, they did this bad thing to Asians. Maybe it was implicit bias. I will point out that Harvard doesn't still today, at least as far as the trial by the trial, did not have any kind of implicit or unconscious bias training uh, as part of their for their 40 full-time admissions staff. They should um, that that. I think people generally, and when you talk about colleges and universities, there's a big brief in our case, none of them defended the, the Asian discrimination piece because it's tough to defend and everybody wants to believe it's, it's only Harvard. We need to live in a world where we can ask these questions, we can get the transparency Neil was talking about, and you're not uh, put into some kind of online graveyard or, or you know, w w when you just speak out. Yeah, so 100% agree with, with Adam on this, and I think this is, this is not about affirmative action. This is a bigger problem that's going on in our campuses. Sometimes it goes by safe spaces or other uh, nomenclature in which the very fact that we're having this debate is itself some sort of triggering mechanism that can't happen on a college campus or poor Adam is gonna be attacked or I will or whatever. And I can't think of something more pernicious to what the entire university ideal is than that. The whole, the reason we're here is to debate these important hard things. Um, and, and you know, I will criticize Adam's views, um, but I will not criticize him. I think he deserves enormous 
um, applause for the work he's doing. And for, you know, we can disagree with it, um, but to disagree with it, but to take it on its own terms. And I just feel like that's being lost in our universities. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, I just, you know, events like this, I think, are really important because they reset a little bit the conversation, and, and most of you are a lot older than the students at Dartmouth, but that's an important, that's actually an important learning mechanism too, um, to see, and I hope that Dartmouth students will see this debate and see, um, you know, what it can accomplish when you actually just talk about the ideas as opposed to saying, oh, that idea is so beyond debate, I can't even have you speak at this campus and we're going to protest you and all these horribly rude things that happen. <clears throat> well, this is getting entirely too cozy. Everyone's agreeing with everyone now. <laughs> um, but Adam, I did want to follow up uh, something that you, um, uh, well, th that Neil had said before. And um, the question is, and, and you've sort of alluded to this, why, why uh, have, why do you think uh, affirmative action has been so widely embraced, um, given the Pew poll you cited and other evidence, uh, including the lack of death threats that you've mentioned? Um, why, why do you think that is? is I mean, is the, is our universities today really so, you know, conformist? Well, I mean, I think it goes without saying that the higher ed establishment is not really in step with mainstream American sort of thought on probably anything. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the way I hear your question, I think there's a couple things going on. Um, Harvard has 40 full-time admissions staff, and I don't even know what their budget is. They don't, they don't even know. You ask them, they, I don't know what our budget is. It's like unlimited. They're probably flying around in private jets or something. Uh, you know, Wash U is hiring temporary graduate students. There's a, there's a real array in terms of resources that are, that are deployed here. But I do think some of what's going on with affirmative action and why we have it is um, Harvard basically needs, and, and I, I will indict every other elite institution this way, they basically need skin color preference because they don't want too many socioeconomically disadvantaged members of those minority groups. I mean, this actually, in the Harvard's report about why it rejected our race-neutral alternatives, they effectively said this, oh, this would change the, the distribution of wealth amongst our racial minority groups. And what that's just code for is they want rich African Americans. They don't want as many poor ones. And so I think you need a skin color preference to get you there, because if you're doing this in a rational way otherwise, there's no way you would prefer the Georgetown Day kid to my hypothetical kid from Chicago, so I think, that's, I think that's why. It's easy, it's fast, it's efficient, and everybody agrees, all of us agree, everybody in America agrees, we can't have an all-white Harvard, or an all-Asian Harvard, or whatever. We can't have a Harvard that is locked out to disadvantaged minority groups. And so we can't have that, we don't wanna see that. What's the easiest way to get from the, a process to something that doesn't look like <clears throat> minorities being locked out? The easiest way is a skin color preference. So, so well, I'll can, can I, can, so I'm, I want to just push back on that a little because, um, uh, you know, after uh, 20 years of being a prisoner of the Beltway, I've, I'm now a prisoner of higher education, and I've watched what what goes on in the in the discussion. And right now, the uh, elite institutions are in a foot race to see who can get the most uh, first in their family. Uh, you know, students first in their family to ever go to college. And there's also a very robust effort that our own admissions people have, have spoken about to increase the number of disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged uh, undergrads. So I, I have to say I find that a, a questionable uh, assertion. I think that there is an acute sensitivity to the fact that, that we're just way too upper middle class? Uh, you know, it's a question of degree. I, I mean, I, I agree with that there's, there's, <clears throat> there's these sort of movements. And Harvard itself, you know, if you, if you qualify, if you're uh, below uh, some income level, I can't remember, it's actually reasonably high. You know, they, they just pay for it. You just get in, you just go. And, and I was confronting uh, the dean of Harvard College, Rakesh Karana, on the fact that it's still true that, you know, three quarters of people on Harvard's campus would be considered wealthy. And I said, you know, what, what's, what do you like so much about rich people? So the fact of the matter is, is that Harvard doesn't, Harvard's college's population does not remotely reflect the socioeconomic distribution in America. Yes, they 
they, they, there are efforts at, at uh, disadvantage. One of the things I'd point out to you is that it's actually more difficult than you think if you're a need-blind institution to figure out whether somebody is disadvantaged, which is one of the reasons why the College Board's adversity score could be a real game changer. Uh, the first gen thing, um, I don't think Harvard has any actual preference for first gens. That's just, you know, we have all the data from Harvard, so I know. Um, I think that's also great. Uh, just, you know, those will create tension. The reason they will create tension is what, uh, what minority group is actually substantially more economically disadvantaged than whites? Asians. What minority group is substantially higher in the first gen college category? Actually, Asians. So now you start to see why some of these things rub up against the first question, which is, do we want Harvard to be 50% Asian? Because if we keep doing all these things that you're talking about, um, Harvard will be 50% Asian. Oh, well, I was just waiting for you to respond. Okay. Um, well, so let's, let's uh, look at that more. Uh, Neil, what do you think about um, shifting the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the emphasis, at least partially, because we're talking about many different factors in admissions, towards uh, economic uh, criteria? Um, there's been a lot of people who've said, you know, you look at, you look at what America looks like today, uh, the largest group of poor are white rural poor. Why don't we uh, move in that direction? Yeah, I think that universities do do that. So, for example, I mean, I'm very skeptical of the idea that Harvard doesn't care about socioeconomic diversity. I mean, this is a school that pioneered the idea that if you have less than $100,000 in income, you get to go there absolutely no, 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 to be free. Fair, to be fair to what I said, they care about it at a certain level. Yeah, and so, and, and, and so I think that that level, though, is pretty strong, and then the question is, since they do care about it at that level, can they actually do more on that and make up for a prohibition on affirmative action? And I think there's no study that says that that's going to work. Even their own experts said that wasn't going to yield sufficient amounts of information. I'm not, and by any stretch, I understand a lot about the Harvard trial, but I know that there was data saying you go from 14% African American to 6% and 14% Hispanic to 9% if you had just socioeconomic. No, Neil, Neil that, that's not correct. That's if you just took race away from them without doing anything. So it's, it's, it's if, you, if you take race away from them and boost the socioeconomic preferences, it goes from like 14% African American to 10 or 11, and Hispanics go up and Asians go up. So you, there's two things. One is they produced a report that said that if you just took race away and did nothing else, that is true. Two thirds of the African Americans and half the Hispanics would not be there. That's, that, that is true. Okay, but well, if you add the socioeconomic preferences, it's like 14 to 10 or 11, and the Hispanics go up and the Asians go up. Well, just I just know it. I think it's page 49 of the plaintiffs' findings of the fact that they, they disagree. Now, obviously, that's the plaintiffs and, and so on, but um, or the, 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 the defense. But, um, but nonetheless, uh, I think the point is there's not a study that says that socioeconomic affirmative action alone will be enough. And so that's why he's going to about abolishing legacies and donor privileges and stuff like that, because I think that's the only way to get there. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. You gotta, oh. you, you gotta do it all. You gotta, you gotta get rid you of it. You gotta do it all. Okay, oh, you gotta so, do it all. Sorry, sorry, Neil. Okay. You gotta do it all. Great. You gotta get rid of the white people preferences, and you gotta boost socioeconomic preferences so that this place that's a great right. gatekeeper like so, this place actually looks a little bit more like America. So you really want the federal mm -hmm. courts running the university system. And let me tell you, that's, I mean, whatever you think of university administrators, boy, that's a dangerous proposition to say. Well, they ran the Charlotte-Mecklenburg School District for a long time. And uh, for the most <laughs> important of reasons in that case. I think and it's important here, too. It, it may be important, but I don't think it's anything like the gravity of segregated schools. Um, it's not even close. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think... Uh, I think the whole idea behind uh, you know, a, a litigation strategy that says federal courts are going to come in and order, you can't look at skin color, but you, and then you can't look at legacy, and you can't look at donors, and you can't look at athletes, and, and I don't know if flute players and stuff is going to be in there too, because I assume they may have a racial distribution effect too. I just think that that is, um, you know, that's not what America's about, and we should, you, if you prove the argument up and win in debates in audiences like this and universities, convince them 
that that's the wrong way to go and adopt a different policy, but don't walk into federal court and have that happen. To be, to be fair, our simulations kept the athletes. Um, there, there, there aren't, there aren't. Because uh, they really matter. No, it's just you don't, <laughs> I, I don't really, I, I won't pretend, I, my, my guess is, and I haven't asked Rick, my guess is you don't get as much bang for your buck there actually aren't as many of them relative to the legacies and the donors and the children and faculty or staff. I also think that they're not yeah. as wildly white as the other categories are, so you, you're kind of trading one thing, the trade-offs aren't as good, but we let them keep the athletes. Um, I should also say, you know, Neil and I really, he, he likes to make it out like we disagree about a lot, we just, we just really don't. All I want is, is for us to agree that the status quo ante, and so the, the, the legal world that we live in today is that they can't use skin color preferences, and then, and then I want to make something clear to you, so that you know, is that while Students for Fair Admissions may well have a different position, my position is once we get there through the courts, it's up to us to decide whether we're going to enact a legal regime that allows those preferences. Once you get where? I'm sorry. I once, once, once we win on Title VI, yeah. then I don't think anything should stop us from changing that back to the current regime if that's what people want to do. All I'm saying is the legal status quo ante is skin color preferences are illegal. I also think they're a bad idea. You think they're a good idea. I want to Title VI to be interpreted like Justice Stevens said, and then to us to go into a world where if we want to change the 64 Civil Rights Act to authorize what happens here at Dartmouth or to authorize a, a skin color preference regime like goes on at every other university that we're talking about, we as a people will be able to do that. I do not personally endorse interpreting the United States Constitution to ban affirmative action, which would bar us from ever making a different decision. I want to make sure that that's clear. So I can't totally follow this, but first of all, I think Justice Stevens in, said that Title VI allows affirmative action. Yeah, I mean the backy thing, yeah. You know, you know where, he, where he said, because what the court has said is that Title VI and the Equal Protection Clause should be interpreted exactly the same way. I disagree with that. Okay. But so so I, I think Title VI on its face This is starting to get a little technical. You are saying that you should win your case, right? That, that Title VI yes. prohibits Harvard from doing what it's doing, Just right? Title VI. Okay. And then the United States Congress could amend Title VI to permit it if we all agreed. Congress? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, well, I, don't, I don't understand. They passed civil rights statutes. The Equality Act is, is you know, we're, we're, we're going to, the Equality Act is going to pass in we, the next 10, had 10, 15 we've, years. We've had, ever since 1964, exactly this kind of affirmative action. You're saying, uh, now all of a sudden, magically, it's, it's illegal under Title VI? Well, maybe, um, but yeah. again, I think the better strategy, if you actually, if you care about this and you think you're right, is to go and convince university after university. And you do ask, and I think you ask a really important question, which is, why should we give any preferences on the basis of skin color at all? And I think that's kind of the nub of the issue. And let me give you two different stories about why. One personally and one as an educator. Because I don't really think of myself as a disadvantaged person in any way, shape, or form uh, at this moment in time. but. That conversation that's been happening over the last 10 days when the president says to four members of Congress, go back, I do think that just my skin color does give me a different perspective on that. And I'd want a university in which, as these events are happening, to have other students who've lived through that. I mean, it started for me when I was three years old, and my... Um, uh, my mom was pulling out of the driveway and someone knocked on the car and started yelling at her and said, go back. And it happens every day. I mean, literally every day. I will undoubtedly leave from here today and get some email saying, go back. Um, I do think that race still matters in this country. I wish it didn't, but I think it matters. It matters even sometimes to me when I meet a person for the first time and I just instantly think something. I think that's just part of what it means right now in our society. And that's why I believe so much in this diversity idea in the higher education setting, because it helps us get past that and think it through. As an educator, I teach criminal law, and I've been privileged to teach at all sorts of places 
uh, around uh, the country. And one year I was teaching at Yale, and I had a class, 60 people, not a single African American in it. And I teach the Bernie Getz case every year, the subway vigilante. And I can tell you that that discussion was different than in the spring, when I still didn't have very many minorities in the class. But there was one guy, actually a wealthy African American guy, um, and I remember this so vividly, um, teaching the case, and he just, he raised his hand and said, let me tell you what it was like. I was in New York at this time, and I couldn't go anywhere without people thinking that I was gonna attack them. And I don't think you can understand the case if you don't have that in the classroom, someone who's lived that. And yes, it was all because of skin color. This person was privileged. So on all the other metrices, he wouldn't have gotten that benefit. But this is why skin color still matters. I wish it didn't, but it does. And the, and the worst part about all this is everybody, while we were listening to this story, uh, had in the back of their heads that that African-American gentleman Neil was just talking about got into Yale because of affirmative action. How do we know? But the fact that we just stigmatized him, in our, in the, at least I did, sitting here, and thinking that he, somehow, some way, he got a preference, and that's why he got into Yale. No, Adam, you yourself admitted that the only way to have those numbers of minority students at those numbers, them. those numbers, but not that individual. Even Harvard would have I don't think some percentage of African Americans if you took race completely away from them. And yet here we are. We're going to stigmatize every single African American at the this Yale Law School. This isn't stigmatizing. This is saying that kid brought something to the setting. He's more valuable. He's that's what you want in a university. But, but maybe he'd be there regardless of whether we had skin color Maybe, maybe not, but we know statistically that not all of them will unless you force courts to do all the things you want in terms of banning I, I just, legacies wonder, and Neil, donors. Neil, what and is the, like right the right number? What is the right number? You know, one thing that the judge asked Rakesh Karana during our trial was, how do you know when you've got enough? Well, I do think it differs from school to school and program to program, and that's why I would like to see flexibility on the, and that's, I think, the way the courts have adopted it. I certainly don't think that a federal court should come in and say it's X number or Y number. But, Absolutely But don't not. you think that, I mean, I, I'm just curious. I, nobody seems to be able to answer this question. You know, the Michigan cases were defended on this ground of something called critical mass that they could never tell you what the number was. And, you know, Rakesh Karana could not answer the judge's question. He would said something similar to what you said. You know, oh, it's just, you know, you feel it's the thing, flexible. Uh, Nobody seems to know this, and, and I, I wonder, if you don't know what the right number is, then you don't know when to stop, when the preferences have gotten too big. I mean, by the way, they are gigantic. You know, I mean, 500% better chance of getting in just by on your skin color. I, I didn't talk about that because I don't, I, I sort of think people generally know how big they are. They are gigantic. So how much is enough? Is it 14%? Is it 10%, is it nine, is it six, is it 20? Well, first of all, I'm skeptical of this 500% thing, and I think that itself is probably pretty stigmatizing. Um, second, I think that the idea that, uh, that, uh, that you have to have some ideal number is ridiculous. I mean, different programs serve different purposes and have different trajectories. And indeed, the whole, my whole point is let the market decide. Someone might want to go to a school with 20% and some 10% and the like. It's up to them to figure that out as long as they are doing the things that I said they got to do, which is diversity along all its levels. It can't be a quota. It's got to be, a, and look, you got to look to the whole person and things like that. But in a circumstance like that, um, you know, just because you can't identify a precise number doesn't mean the overall program is wrong. That's why I think the Supreme Court got it so wrong in the gerrymandering case recently because they said, well, we can't identify with perfection what the di ideal district would look like, so therefore we shouldn't do anything at all. That doesn't make sense to me. You know, you can still have a rough approximation and, see, and know in general whether something is, too, is, is tremendously unfair. I think one big difference between us is that um, I'm real skeptic of... Uh, higher ed admissions officials doing this right, and Neil is, is willing to indulge in the, the presumption of good faith. But I will make the following point. Uh, you know, Neil keeps talking about was defer to the private sector, was defer to these educational institutions. These are the very same places that are the, the echo chambers 
where naysayers are shouted down. And I don't really think there's a ton of people uh, in the higher ed admissions racket who are right wingers. Um, I really don't. And I don't think they're approaching it necessarily with the kind of nuanced view that Neil is articulating. I actually, you know, with the way you talk about it, I'm not sure it would be all that bad, but I don't think the way you talk about it is the way that it happens. And I'm skeptical, and you're not. Well, I think this is um, a uh, conversation to be continued with a dozen admissions uh, uh, department chairs uh, who I think would push back on you, but uh, I look forward to having uh, that conversation. So we got um, um, a, a veritable flood of cards uh, asking uh, Neil just to comment briefly on that other thing that's been going on <laughs> um, in Washington, D.C. Uh, so if you would um, give us, uh, you know, the benefit of uh, a quick uh, capsule summary of where you think the world is the day after Mueller. <laughs> And, and if, if you know what Bob Mueller thinks on this issue of diversity, too, I, but no, no, never mind, go on. Can, can I just move into your house and stay here? Yeah. <laughs> um, we have lots of room. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, some of you know this. I, I, when I was my first tour at the Justice Department, I wrote the special counsel regulations back in 1999 that Mueller was appointed under. So um, I've had this kind of weird vantage point um, in, in watching this. And um, I expect some of you watched the hearings yesterday. He testified in two different committees. And... Um, uh, I think a lot of the hearing went as expected. Um, I don't think that Mueller wanted to be there by any stretch um, and was basically a hostile witness for both sides um, and uh, just answering yes or no questions where he had to, wanting to stick to the four corners of the report. I would say that the morning um, went not great for the Democrats because they were in it, they looked like they were just in it for themselves for camera time and um, you know didn't ask a lot of the questions that could have been asked to try and get actually somewhere I think the, there were a couple exceptions to that I think Chairman Nadler right away I think established that Trump was claiming no collusion that the report found no collusion no obstruction and totally exonerated him and I think those questions were immediately asked and put to rest this idea that the report cleared the president and stuff like that and I think Ted Lieu from California similarly I think methodically going through one page of the report, page 97, show, this is the page that, uh, that shows that Jeff Sessions, that, that Trump tried to unrecuse his Attorney General Jeff Sessions to try and end the Mueller probe, that that page established all three elements of obstruction of justice, an obstructive act, criminal intent, and a nexus to a criminal proceeding. I thought that was pretty huge, that Mueller admitted each of the three elements was met. Mueller later took back something else he said to Ted Lieu, but I think that really was the, the headline in the first hearing. And then in the second hearing, um, the Intel one, I thought that went a lot better because both sides just were a lot more professional. It was much more about just trying to actually extract information. And I thought Chairman Schiff in the first three minutes of the hearing was pretty devastating to Trump. I mean, he got Mueller to admit Number one, Russia massively interfered in the 2016 election. Number two, uh, that the Trump campaign, the Trump campaign um, benefited from that and welcomed it. Welcomed it. Uh, excuse me, that they welcomed it, actively welcomed it. Number three, that they benefited from it. Number four, that Donald Trump Jr. said that he loved it. And number five that Trump himself was engaged in business dealings in Moscow when he was telling the American people that he wasn't. Those five things together are pretty significant on the Trump side. And then what he said later in the hearing, which is not political, it shouldn't be political, is the Russians are doing it right now as we sit here. And uh, that the 2020 election is going to be all sorts of new different techniques, whether it's deep fakes or whatever, and I just really hope as you come out of this room, I don't care if you can be conservative, liberal, whatever, but the idea that our most sophisticated and dangerous adversary is doing this, it's a clear and present threat to our democracy. 
I, I, I wish we don't think about it in terms of 2016 and who won and who's legitimate and all that, and just think going forward, what are we going to do? Um, I've got a good story here. I would like all of you to check out Congressman Ted Lieu's Twitter feed and his comments about the Harvard case. <laughs> because Congressman Ted Lieu does not agree that what Harvard did to Asian Americans is okay. Check it out. Okay, so we're ending on a note telling you to deepen your engagement with social media. And uh, <laughs> as if that weren't enough, uh, I hope you will uh, give our speakers a hearty round of applause for a great event.